Ancient Egypt, in its different dynastic iterations, lasted for 3,000 years. That's a long time. More years passed between the first dynasty and Cleopatra than Cleopatra and now. A lot can happen in 3,000 years. Control of ancient Egypt passed through the hands of 30 dynasties. At different points in history, Egypt was conquered by the Assyrians, the Persians, and the Greek Macedonians. Cleopatra herself was actually Greek. But one conquest that doesn't get much attention is that of the Nubian, or Kushite Empire from modern-day Sudan. They stormed into Egypt, took control, and ushered in the 25th dynasty, the age of the Nubian pharaohs. The mighty King P.A. and his God. There was trouble brewing in Egypt. It was the middle of the 8th century BC, around 750. The empire was in disarray. Regional leaders were squabbling with each other. No one seemed to be able to decide on much of anything. In the south, King P.A. was consolidating his power and building up his armies. He was the king of the Kushites, a kingdom in Nubia, south of Egypt, along the Nile in modern-day Sudan. Now, the Kushite king was determined to expand his empire, in his way was a temperamental Egyptian chieftain and a dispute over godly territory. The cult of the god Amun-Ra was a pretty big deal in the histories of both the ancient Egyptians and the Kushites. Amun-Ra was basically the top god of the Egyptian pantheon during the New Kingdom period. He became known as the self-created one and king of the gods who created all things, and over the years, his worship spread beyond Egypt's borders and into the kingdom of Kush. The Kushites considered Amun-Ra to be their primary god, and they started building temples dedicated to him in their capital city, Napata. The Kushite rulers identified themselves as the living embodiments of the god and claimed to be direct descendants of the Egyptian pharaohs, who were themselves thought to be direct offspring of Amun-Ra. In 728 BCE, Tefnacht, an Egyptian chieftain in what's now Libya in the Nile Delta, was threatening to invade Upper Egypt, Amun-Ra's mythical homeland. And by the way, when historians and Egyptologists say Upper Egypt, they're really talking about the southern half of the Nile that stretches into modern-day Sudan. The Nile does flow south to north, a pretty rare thing for a river to do, so the upper end of it is really in the south and the lower end of it is in the north. Fun fact. Anyway, the threat posed by Tefnacht was a direct challenge to King Pierre's authority. Pierre fashioned himself the protector of Amun-Ra's sacred homeland, and he wasn't pleased about the invasion from Tefnacht. To defend Amun-Ra's homeland and maintain his divine mandate, Pierre mobilized his army and sailed northward up the Nile to confront Tefnacht. Taking Egypt from the Delta Force Pierre's forces initially faced Tefnacht's river fleet, which was stationed near the city of Heracleopolis, and then sailed down, or I guess up the Nile. Pierre and his commanders had a pretty good strategy going into their invasion. They used a combination of archers and ramming ships to sow chaos amongst the Egyptian defense. The Kushite fleet rammed into the Egyptian ships while the archers picked off anyone who either hadn't drowned, got eaten by crocodiles, or were generally unintelligent enough to stick around and try to keep fighting. In short, Tefnacht's fleet didn't stand a chance, and P.A. and the Nubians moved from their ships onto the land. The land battle of Heracleopolis was a lot tougher for the Nubians, though. Tefnacht had rallied a few other Delta princedoms to his cause by the time P.A. made it clear he wanted more than just his own Kushite territory. Together, the coalition was a pretty strong one, and they were determined to resist the Nubian invasion. Tefnacht was able to gather together a powerful army despite the general Egyptian disorder that the empire was going through at the time. It was made up of troops from various cities and regions throughout the delta. Think of the delta not like the airline, but like the mouth of the Nile that widens into the Mediterranean, kind of like a two-dimensional inverted pyramid. This coalition army that Tefnacht built was apparently somewhere around 20,000 soldiers strong, a pretty significant force for the time. They were well-equipped and well-trained. The Nubians had some work to do. The coalition's strategy was mostly a defensive one, though. They were focused on defending their territory and preventing the Kushite from advancing any further into their eponymous delta region. They knew the terrain and were familiar with a lot of the conditions, and they used it to their advantage. Still, though, the Kushite army was able to break through the lines of the delta force and inflict significant casualties. With the Libyan army in disarray, PA's forces advanced further north down the Nile. The next major objective was Memphis, the ancient capital of Egypt and probably the most important one in terms of taking control of the empire. The city was heavily fortified and defended by a massive garrison. PA laid siege to the city and after some months, 
they were able to finally breach the walls and capture the capital. The fall of Memphis basically meant the fall of Egypt. It was the keystone victory for P.A. and his forces. The 25th dynasty of the Nubian pharaohs had almost begun. All that was left was the coronation. Crowning a Nubian Pharaoh Coronations are extravagant events. Just ask the new king of England and all the hype that went into that. In ancient Egypt, it might have been even more so. Most of what we know about the coronation of P.A. comes from something called the Victory Stella of P.A., which was carved into the walls of the Nubian temple in Amun in Jebel Barkal in modern-day Sudan. So according to the inscription, once P.A. had taken Memphis, he traveled to Thebes, the capital of Upper Egypt, sometime in the second decade of his reign as Kushite king. Thebes was south of Memphis, but P.A.'s army had kind of skipped over it because of its heavy fortifications. It wasn't a city to be messed with. It was also a city that P.A. really wanted, more so than Memphis. Thebes was one of Amun Ra's original stopping grounds, and it had a lot of significance for the Kushites. A victorious P.A. reportedly marched into the city accompanied by a whole slew of soldiers, officials, and priests, as well as his sister, wife, and daughter. He made his way, unsurprisingly, to the Temple of Amun, where he was greeted by the High Priest of Amun and other important officials. P.A. then underwent a ceremony known as the Coronation of the King. Again, all of this is according to a piece of stone with some inscriptions in it that was found thousands of years after the actual event took place. During the ceremony, he was anointed with holy oil and was given a bunch of kingly stuff that symbolized his newfound conquest of the ancient empire. These included the white crown of Upper Egypt, the red crown of Lower Egypt, and the double crown that symbolized the unification of Egypt. He was also presented with a royal scepter and was seated on the throne of Horus. The Nubian pharaoh had arrived. After the coronation ceremony, P.A. was given a tour of the temple, during which he made offerings to the gods and received the blessing of the priest. He then made his way to the main palace, where he was formally introduced to the Egyptian officials and was welcomed as the new pharaoh of Egypt. Let's take a step back, though. P.A. was able to successfully conquer Egypt, and he did it so effectively because he never abolished the existing Egyptian institutions or cultural practices. Instead, he did his best to integrate himself into the existing Egyptian power structures. He presented himself as a legitimate pharaoh who was continuing the traditions of the previous Egyptian rulers. Now it helped because the Kushites slash Nubians already worshipped Amun-Ra. The line between the Kushite kingdom and the Egyptian one was blurry. Keep in mind that there had been trade and interaction going on between the two regions for centuries. It's kind of like if New Orleans suddenly decided to invade the modern city of Memphis in the U.S. I mean, sure, the cultures were a bit different, but they both probably liked a good barbecue. Anyway, P.A.'s approach to the coronation and his subsequent ruling style slash belief at Amun-Ra helped him legitimize his rule in a lot of ways, which helped make sure that the Egyptian people accepted him as their new ruler, which they did. He and his Nubian predecessors would rule Egypt for more than a century. Kushite Might We'll get to what came next in a second. But first, let's focus on the Kushites, and specifically why they were really able to conquer Egypt in the first place. A big reason behind it was their military strategy. One of the main tactics the Kushite army took real advantage of was their incredibly skilled use of weapons and military technology, advanced for the time anyway. The Kushites were known for their skill with a composite bow, a bow that could shoot arrows further and more accurately than any Egyptian bow could. They also used iron-tipped spears, which were stronger and more durable than the bronze-tipped spears used by the Egyptians. And then there were the war elephants. The Kushites had them, and they used them to devastating effect. It's a curiosity how they got them in the front lines of the Egyptian battlefields, though. I mean, I like to think the elephants just swam there alongside the Kushite fleet of ships using their trunks as propellers, but that's probably not what happened. Well, wait, maybe it was. There are actually theories that say that's exactly how the Kushites got their elephants down the river, though probably minus the trunk propeller stuff. Other theories say they might have used specially constructed ramps or gangways that allowed the elephants to walk from the ships to the shore. Another possibility is that the Kushites may have used crane-type things to hoist their war elephants from their ships onto the shore. Now that could have been a stretch, but given the Kushite mastery of engineering, architecture, and construction techniques, it's not out of the realm of possibility. The Kushites were also really good at surprise attacks. They were known for their ability to move quickly and quietly, which allowed them to take their enemies by surprise and launch pretty devastating attacks. This strategy was particularly effective against the Egyptians, who were used to fighting in more traditional battles that involved large-scale maneuvers and formations. 
Now you put elephants in the mix, which are really hard to sneak in anywhere, and you've got a pretty good recipe for conquering one of the greatest civilizations in the history of humanity. Kushite planning. It takes a lot of planning to conquer an empire. I'm not telling you nothing you don't know. PA and the Kushites had a lot of prep work to do before invading what was probably the strongest empire in the world at the time. Kind of like how a line cook has to make sure all the ingredients in the kitchen are there and ready to go. Except for the Kushites, it was weapons and alliances. The conquest of Egypt didn't just happen overnight. It was a long and complex process that involved a whole lot of strategic planning. We've already mentioned how the Kushites were able to achieve this feat, in part, due to their superior military tactics and tech. But a big part of it was also their ability to forge alliances with other regional powers. The Kushites were good diplomats. Before meeting Tefnacht and his Delta Force on the Nile, PA forged important alliances with other regional powers. One of the key elements of the Kushite strategy was their use of diplomacy to gain the support of other regional powers in Nubia and beyond. One important alliance was the one they forged with the Meshwesh, a Libyan tribal group that lived in the Western Nile Delta region. The Meshwesh had their own beef with the ruling Egyptian dynasty at the time and saw a good opportunity to align themselves with the Kushites. It was an alliance that played a pretty big role in the Kushite conquest of Lower Egypt, including the eventual sacking of Memphis. Another important aspect of the Kushite strategy was their use of religion and cultural symbolism to legitimize their claims to the Egyptian throne. The Kushites identified themselves as the rightful heirs to the legacy of the ancient pharaohs, and they used this claim to gain the support of the Egyptian people. They also adopted many of the religious practices and beliefs of the Egyptians, and like we said before, the fact that they already worshipped Amun was a feather in their collective cap. In terms of military planning, the Kushites were well prepared for the conquest of Egypt. They had developed advanced military tactics and weaponry, including the use of chariots and archers, which gave them a significant advantage over the Egyptian armies. They also had a well-trained and disciplined army, with a clear chain of command and a strong sense of loyalty to their king. The New Capital of Egypt Changing leadership often means changing capital cities. Many countries and empires have switched up their capitals over the years. Turkey moved its capital from Istanbul to Ankara after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The early days of the U.S. saw its capital move from New York City to Philadelphia before Washington, D.C. was constructed. Egypt's own capital was moved several times too, from Memphis to Thebes to Amarna to Alexandria. But nestled in between those moves, there was Napata, the Kushite capital and for a brief time de facto capital of Egypt during parts of Nubian pharaoh's 100-year reign. Napata was located about 300 miles south of Thebes along the Nile, south of what's called the Third Cataract in Nubia. It was originally an Egyptian city founded by Pharaoh Thutmose III in the 15th century BC, but internal problems led to a fractured Egypt around 1075 BC that saw the Kushites come to power, take control of the city, and make it their capital. It was a trade hub that connected different regions throughout Africa, and it was incredibly well planned. The whole city was laid out in a grid pattern of intersecting right angles, similar to the Roman style, but a long time before they ever set foot on the scene. And then there were the pyramids. The capital had impressive pyramids that, while not as massive as the great one farther north, were definitely impressive in their own right. One of the greatest structures in Napata was the Temple of Amun. Now remember that PA and the Kushites were really into Amun-Ra. The temple was a massive complex that included multiple courtyards, halls, and shrines, as well as a large lake that was used for religious ceremonies. It had all kinds of elaborate carvings and paintings and was one of the most important religious centers in the ancient world. After PA But PA didn't conquer all of Egypt. Despite the stella that said he was crowned as the pharaoh of Upper and Lower Egypt, there was still a lot of work to be done. After PA's initial victories, his control over Egypt was really only concentrated in the northern part, which again is called Lower Egypt but there were still a lot of cities in Upper Egypt that remained resistant to his rule. Following PA's conquest, there was a period of transition during which he worked on solidifying his hold on his newly conquered territories. PA appointed local officials and governors to maintain order and collect tribute on his behalf, and he established a new administration that blended Nubian and Egyptian elements, often allowing local Egyptian rulers to keep their positions under his authority. PA laid the foundation for the next pharaohs of the 25th dynasty, including his successor, Chebidku. Chebidku further extended Nubian control over Egypt. He campaigned in Upper Egypt, pacifying more areas that were still resistant to Nubian rule. Under Chebidku, the Kushites were able to more fully unify Upper and Lower Egypt. 
Napata wouldn't remain the capital of Egypt for very long. It's worth noting that even though PA ruled Egypt from Napata, its status as a capital was kind of in a weird gray area. Chebet Kuh made Memphis the official capital when he came to power, a move that probably helped him legitimize his pharaoh status in the eyes of the people. He also launched a series of successful military campaigns against some of the holdouts in the south that were still resistant to Kushite rule. But he was also a good diplomat. He was able to gain the support of the local population. Again, both the Egyptians and the Kushites loved Amun-Ra, and this shared religious identity helped him as he worked on fully unifying the entire empire and consolidating Kushite rule. The Fall But nothing lasts forever. The Assyrians were expanding their empire from the east and had their sights set on Egypt. In 673 BC, the Assyrian king Ur-Sahardan launched a series of raids into Lower Egypt, but Egypt's second to last Nubian pharaoh, Taharqa, was able to push him back. Ur-Sahardan was persistent, though. Two years later, he came back in full force. He apparently had been given a prophecy. The Cliff Notes version basically proclaimed that he'd go forth and conquer the world, and part of that world included Egypt, tempting foreshadowing. Soon after the prophecy, the Assyrian king and his forces began defeating the Egyptians. Things were going well. But then, Esar Hadan got some bad news in the form of an omen. Despite his early victories, he became convinced that he'd be defeated, so he performed something called the Substitute King Ritual, where he basically appointed a fake king and dressed him up to play the part. The point of the ritual was to transfer any potential threats or bad fortune onto the new Substitute King. He'd absorb any negative forces or divine wrath that might otherwise be directed at Esa Hardan. Scapegoat substitute king in place, a newly confident Esa Hardan went on to sack Memphis. He had a victory stell inscribed after the, well, victory that detailed the peace and level-headedness with which he took the capital. Just kidding, it was pretty violent. In part, he boasted that I slew multitudes, I besieged, I captured, I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire. The root of Kush I tore out of Egypt and not one therein escaped to submit to me. Except some did escape, including Farah Taharqa. Esarhaddon would depart Memphis shortly after his victory, and in his absence, the Nubian pharaoh was able to regroup and take the city back in 669 BC. As Esarhaddon was on his way back to finish what he started, he got sick and died. Apparently, his substitute King Voodoo doll spell thing didn't work. His successor, Ashurbanipal, would finish the job, though. He invaded and retook Memphis in 667 BC, along with much of Lower Egypt. Taharqa was forced to flee to Thebes. Some accounts say he died there. Others say he ended up back in Napata. But in any case, he was succeeded by Egypt's final Nubian pharaoh, Tantamani. By 663, the jig was up. Ashurbanipal and the Assyrian army helped out Samtik I, a prince in Sais, a city in the western Nile Delta, which was still not pleased with the Kushite pharaohs. Their combined forces lay siege to Thebes and eventually sacked it. Tantamani fled to Kush and the Assyrians installed Samtik as the new pharaoh. The age of the Nubian pharaohs was finished. A century of Kushite rule of Egypt was finished. The Assyrians were smart. They didn't want to overextend what was becoming a vast empire, and recognizing Samtik I as a pharaoh was a way to basically subordinate Egypt and use politics to their advantage. It allowed them to effectively govern indirectly while avoiding the challenges and expenses associated with direct rule. The Kushite Empire would linger on for a while in various iterations, though it would never exert the same kind of influence it once did. By the 4th century CE, the Kushite Empire ceased to exist as a centralized power, but Nubian civilization and culture endured in the region, leaving a lasting impact on the later kingdoms and societies that would pop up in the area. What else do you want to know about the Nubian pharaohs of Egypt? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.